This is KGW News at noon. We're tapped. We have had over eight fires in the last three days, and not just our area, but across uh, you know some parts of Oregon and Washington. Our guys are tired. We don't have the resources to handle the operations that we're at right now. Firefighters from around the state of Washington drove through the night to reach Cowlitz County and help crews there that are stretched thin from responding to so many fires in just a few days. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Brenda Braxton. You know, right now, a big priority is containing the North Maple Fire. Christine Pitowanich just got an up-close look at that area. And Christine, firefighters say they think they know what started this. Brenda, yes, they think that a small burn pile got out of control. And at last check, evacuations are still in place for people living on Walker Road or just off it. But yes, I can tell you that firefighters here in Cowlitz County are so exhausted after responding to so many fires this week. That's why they're grateful for the help they've received from across the state, firefighters who arrived today to help. But take a look at some of the conditions they've had to deal with on the North Mabel Fire. It broke out yesterday afternoon southeast of Kelso and it scorched 30 to 40 acres so far. Flames got up to 40 feet tall at one point. It's burning in rugged terrain and gosh, long shifts have made things really challenging for Cowlitz County fire crews. Many of them have worked really hard. So we're talking 26, 27 hour shifts trying to contain the flames threatening about 100 homes. We spoke with a man who lives in the evacuation area. He never actually felt the need to leave, but he was ready just in case. He says it sounded like a war zone with all the helicopters. But when he walked around outside, that's when he saw the flames. It just looked like uh, a wall of flames that you didn't really want to be around, so he just got the heck out. We got fire right to the driveways of multiple homes on the bottom end of the fire. So we were fighting fire from the, from the porches and driveways of homes. Wow, those firefighters doing a great job. I will say overnight, uh, flames did slow down. And even though there's a lot of burned out spots, it is possible that any wind at all could pick up embers and start a new fire. So crews are watching things pretty closely. Today, they're going to be working on containment and building a line around the fire. Uh, by the way, a burn ban is in effect in Cowlitz County. Firefighters say when uh, that fire started, the North Maple fire started, the ban was already in place. So the big takeaway here, even if it feels cooler out, even if it feels damp, don't burn anything. Back to you. That is great advice. Thank you, Christine. We want to bring in meteorologist Rod Hill now. And Rod, I guess on the positive side, yeah. conditions are improving for those firefighters. Oh, big time. Every single box in terms of the weather itself is checked positive that uh, firefighters would want. So, you know, this morning we had a little touch of light rain that moved through. Not everybody picked up something, and those that did, it was mostly traceable amounts. You can see the rain right now around Salem getting ready to pick up again. But up north in Longview, it's currently dry and right on the edge of mostly cloudy conditions. So our temperatures, and Christine alluded to a lot of this, are some 10 to 15 degrees cooler today than what we have been running. You want cool, damp weather to be a positive when it comes to lowering fire danger. We're getting that. Gusty winds have ended. That was a big culprit probably in the fires that we've covered the last couple of days. And then tomorrow, some more of what we could really use, and that is hours of soaking rain coming in tomorrow afternoon with an actual weather front. Uh, at high noon, it's been just a solid overcast all day. We're currently sitting at 55 degrees here in Portland. We could still get a bit of rain from time to time coming through. Anything would be light. Again, you folks in Salem seeing some rain pick up right now. I think we have a chance to get up to about 60 compared to temperatures that were as high as 77 yesterday. Brenda. All right. Thank you much, Rod. Well, in less than an hour, Oregon lawmakers will hold the first hearing on a bill to disarm campus police at public universities. Right now, police at both Portland State and the University of Oregon carry guns. If this proposal passes, officers could only carry tasers and pepper spray starting January 1st. State Representative Diego Hernandez introduced the bill last month after working with a student advocacy group. The kids argue armed campus police are unnecessary and officers disproportionately target minorities. But critics say disarming police makes it harder to keep campuses safe. 
That hearing starts at 1 o'clock in Salem. The man accused of killing two people within hours of each other had a bail hearing today. The shocking stranger on stranger shootings happened in Portland back in November. 26 year old James Barquette has been behind bars ever since. KGW's Tim Gordon has been covering this story since the beginning. So Tim, will this man have a chance to get out? Judge Thomas Ryan, and just outside the courtroom right now at the courthouse downtown. And the hearing is now going to take a lunch break before both the prosecution and the defense could make their final arguments in the matter of bail. But we get to the video now, and this is the 26 year old defendant wearing a white button down shirt in court today. Marquette's been held without bail since he was arrested only a few hours after the execution style murders. Police found 70 year old Carol Horner dead under the west end of the Morrison Bridge the night of November 19th. Then, very early the next morning, just a few hours later, police found 51-year-old Brian Hansen dead on the Burnside Bridge. Both victims suffered single, close-range gunshot wounds to the head. Today, two Portland police homicide detectives took the stand. They described the crime scenes and the similarity of the single bullet casings found at each one. Arquette was arrested with a handgun holding the same type of a shell casing. And they continued to lay out the case from there. Now, the defense tried to get the judge to not consider certain hearsay-based evidence, statements from others mostly, but the judge did not agree with that broad request, so now the judge is going to consider all that was presented. But again, we have to wait until this afternoon for that decision, Brenda, and take a lunch break, and the final arguments from both sides will be heard by the judge before he rules. Back to you. Absolutely, and as you were talking, we're looking at that, looking at that live picture of Judge Thomas Ryan there in court. Uh, keep his... Boy, who could forget that video? We have some new information now on this deadly officer-involved shooting in Douglas County. A grand jury has ruled it was justified. That's according to our news partner, KEZI. This happened in the small town of Green on March 9th. Police spotted a stolen vehicle at a Love's travel stop. When officers tried to stop the driver, the suspect took off and ended up in this rancher's field. During the shooting, the car burst into flames. Investigators say they found a man's body inside, but they haven't identified him yet. Officers also found several weapons and rounds of ammunition inside that car. A former Tigard High School teacher and coach accused of sexually abusing two students has changed his plea to guilty on all charges. A judge sentenced 40-year-old Marcus Jolly to 24 months in prison. Officers took him into custody last year. Police say he abused a student from 2005 to 2006 and inappropriately touched another student in 2016. Jolly left Tigard High after working there for more than a decade. The Florida man accused of sending mail bombs to President Trump's critics will appear in federal court today. Caesar Sayok is expected to plead guilty. Police say he sent explosive devices to prominent Democrats, including former President Barack Obama and former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Officers intercepted at least a dozen homemade pipe bombs before taking Sayok into custody in October. He could face life in prison. New Zealand's Prime Minister has banned the sale of military-style semi-automatic weapons and high-capacity magazines. The new law goes into effect in three weeks and it has bipartisan support. The changes come less than a week after a gunman with semi-automatic weapons opened fire at two mosques in Christchurch. Fifty people died. Today, hundreds of mourners gathered for victims' funerals, among them a 14-year-old high school student. And now an update on Brexit. The EU says it will delay Britain's departure if Parliament agrees to the Prime Minister's divorce deal. Now that's a tall order because British lawmakers have already rejected it twice. The UK is set to leave in eight days, but Theresa May wants a three-month extension. Experts caution a Brexit without a deal could spell economic disaster. Well, the tents and trash blocking the I-205 trail under Sandy Boulevard are gone. City crews cleaned it up yesterday after a KGW report. But illegal campsites are an ongoing problem. Right now, there are about 200 across the city. 
As Lindsay Nadrich reports, a new audit calculates how much the cleanup is costing us. This video from Bike Portland got a lot of attention this week. Trash and tents piled up so much, there was only a shoulder width gap for bikers to get through. City crews cleaned it up, but many say it won't be long before it looks like this again. If we don't clean up these sites on a very regular basis, the costs and time to clean them up rise exponentially. The city last cleaned it up on February 21st. That time it took four days, two crews and cost $4,485. To put that in perspective, the average cleanup costs $600. Unfortunately, illegal campsites like this one are popping up all over Portland. Just check out this map. Each dot represents campsites reported in the last week. So from March 11th to the 17th, the city took 687 reports from people. Some were duplicates, but about 200 campsites were identified throughout the city. The total cost to address these illegal campsites last year came in at $3.6 million, and the city says a record amount of trash was collected. In 2018, more than 60,000 bags of trash, 38,000 needles, 47,000 pieces of drug paraphernalia and more than 55,000 biohazards were cleaned up. So it may not surprise you to hear the audit released today says the homeless urban camping impact reduction program is stretched to its limits. Many point to the lack of affordable housing in Portland as the root of the problem. But the city said there's no one answer to fix this and said it will take many agencies working together to come up with a solution. That was Lindsay Nadrich reporting. The audit also found there needs to be a better system to evaluate which campsites are highest risk and need to be cleaned up first.